So hi, everyone, and welcome to this session on global politics and local practices of policy transfer in an unsettled world. Uh, so this panel addresses the changing nature of policy transfer, focusing on global and local politics and the global shifting order. Uh, today's panel will focus on policy transfer within international development, mapping the flow of ideas from north to south and analyzing the nature of uneven relations of power between wealthy and poorer nations. The last paper of today's panel is addressing South-South policy transfer, which actually transitions very well into tomorrow's panel, which is about newer forms of agency and rising powers. This panel will be led by Sam. Um, so the themes of the two panels have been divided to focus on the new and contemporary changes. I'll just introduce uh, today's panelists. So we have Devjani Das Gupta, Sam Hickey, Giles Mohan, Ali Oban, Ifan Yu, Chipwe Anie, Lydia Cabral, Les Levido, Claudia Schmidt. So we have, sorry, Sam, you were saying. Yeah, there's, there was a mistake in the program on um, Lydia's paper, uh, Lydia and colleagues paper. Is ah, it, it, sorry. It, as you pointed out, because it focused on South South, it's actually in tomorrow's morning. Yeah. So, so we okay. have to do this morning. Sorry, I should have gone. Okay, no, no, that's fine. I was just following the, the order of, on, online. But actually, this means that everybody has ample time for discussions um, and more time for presentations. So I'll just move over to uh, Devjani. Her paper is titled Policy Transfer Through the Global Good Governance Agenda and Changing Institutional Values at the Local Level, the Case of Local Governments in West Bengal, India. So over to you, Devjani. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity of sharing my research with you all. This is um, a paper from my PhD. Um, so let me start. It's uh, okay. So let me see if I can share screen. Uh, is that visible to everyone? Yes. yes, thank you. You so, may want to go to uh, presentation mode. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so um, this is about policy transfer through the global good governance agenda and changing institutional values at the local level, the case of local governments in West Bengal, India. So my research basically looks at the <clears throat> implicit tensions that underpin policy prescriptions of the global aid agencies on uh, the good governance agenda. So I, I suppose we more or less we know that since the 1990s, there was this uh, agenda coming up in the most of the development discourses about how to deliver good gov government and good governance. And so uh, I, I wanted to see how these ideas are enacted through different kinds of state practices on the ground uh, and whether they have different implications at the grassroots, and um, if at all, how these policy frames, these policy um, prescriptions are responsible for changing the institutional values at the local level. So uh, for the institutions, I have chosen local government institutions because I felt that that is the nearest uh, government, the, the form of the state that the people can see. And um, so the local government always, to speak in the words of Heller, that it enhances the points of contact between the state and the citizens. So that would be the perfect site to see how these agendas interact with the people. So I chose the local gov government institutions as the site. And I have chosen two development agencies, the World Bank and the DFID, because I, I will see how these um, values are playing out through the state practices through two projects. Uh, one is uh, sponsored by the World Bank, and the other is sponsored by the DFID. So I did a scanning of the uh, human develop the, the World Development Reports. Uh, and some other documents of the World Bank. And the major themes 
uh, that came out that seemed to project the vision of good governance of World Bank. So through up these things like uh, administrative efficiency, effective delivery of services, um, economic management, supervision of financial markets where the state will only be the catalyst. And a very important thing that repeatedly came up, I also I will also discuss it later when I discuss the state practices, which is the existence of conditionalities. So conditionalities as an instrument in exchange for financial assistance. And these conditionalities uh, also uh, have these values underpinned, like uh, the ad administrative efficiency, accountability, uh, financial management, and uh, service delivery. Uh, then I went to some of the uh, materials of the DFID UK, and it seemed more uh, tempered by the United Nations concept of uh, participatory uh, practices, inclusive governance, more political dimensions coming in, and a synthesis of economic management and um, you know participation of, of the people. So uh, it, it, it was closer, it seemed it was closer to the idea of building effective state society linkages. And that is what I've also tried to see when I saw the impact of the project in West Bengal. So when I uh, look at the broader context in India, in how the local government institutions emerged in India, this was not exactly a consequence of the Western um, development discourses. So it was not that decentralization discourse as we see emerging in the late 90s. It was uh, in 1950 when the Indian constitution was being drafted, there was an intense political debate among the uh, pioneers of the nationalists of Indian independence, post-independence India. So the major two figures who stand out at that time, on one hand it was uh, M.K. Gandhi, and the other was the <coughs> chairperson of the drafting, uh, drafting committee of the Indian constitution, which was B.R. Ambedkar. Uh, M.K. Gandhi was all for uh, giving autonomy to the local institutions, to the villages. And he wanted uh, that uh, India should have, the independent India should have strong uh, local government institutions. B.R. Ambedkar believed that India is an intensely caste-ridden society, very unequal society. So if the local government institutions are entirely autonomous, then it will, there will be, nobody can stop elite capture. And therefore the nature of the, nature of the local government institutions has to be such that it will be guided from above and the underlining institutional value should be that they uh, the government intervenes at the local levels against the prevailing power structures so that the panchayats can really be built, installed as people's organizations. So more than the institution, it, it should represent people's voices. So finally, um, finally, the, the, it, the, institution, the Constitution of India provided for uh, local governance institutions which is called the Panchayati uh, Raj institutions, Panchayats in India. But the institutional value was this. So the provision was this, that decentralization will be there, but it has to be guided from above. So we start from this premise that this is what Indian local government institutions are about. This is the value underpinning it. So the state practices should actually uh, build the institutions in such a manner or function in such a manner that they are projected, the people people can feel that panchayats are our institution. So they voice our concerns and they can engage with the government there. So this is a very complicated uh, way how Panchayati Raj institutions are um, structured in India. So uh, the yellow portions just, I, I don't want to go into details, the yellow portions just suggest that it has it's a three-tiered um, structure at the district level, block level, and then the village council level. And the red portion is West Bengal specific because India has so many states. So each state has again been given the power to uh, 
frame their own um, uh, laws regarding uh, how they want to structure the panchayats. So West Bengal has, uh, be, below the village council, West Bengal also has another tier, which is the uh, ward or the village level. And there they had formed the village development committee or the uh, Gramunan Samiti, it is called over there. It is the executive wing of the Gram Sangha. So these are the different layers. When we come to West Bengal, uh, there has been, West Bengal is a unique state in, to study local governance institutions because the law was passed in the framework, the constitution provided for uh, local panchayats in 1950, but it was not until 1978 that it was actually implemented in West Bengal when a left front alliance uh, government came into power in West Bengal in 1977. So in 1978, there was a, the social democratic regime led by the Communist Party of India, Marxist, and this party actually installed, uh, this alliance actually installed the Panchayati Raj institutions at the ground level in West Bengal. And then uh, this alliance went on to govern the state for the next 34 years before being unseated in uh, 2011 by a populist right regime. But by then, the institutions had really taken root because in the first 10 years of their uh, rule, the left front regime had combined um, these institutions, the local government institutions with a host of other um, reforms like land reforms, the sharecropping, things like that. So distribution of land. So they had really taken roots. So about the motives, we will come up later. But uh, so the next regime, populist right regime, continued with the same structures but we'll see how, whether the nature of the institutions was same or not. So how, how did the global discourses <clears throat> interact with these two regimes? So between 2005 to 2011, there was a DFID project. Uh, it was called Strengthening Rural Development. It was funded by um, DFID, as, as I said, that was brought in by the left front government. And, uh, it ended in 2011, which exactly co coincided with when the new government came in, the right populist government came in. And so the right populist government continued with the World Bank project, which was, which was actually designed by the end of the left front, but it was implemented during the next um, uh, government which from 2011 to, to, I have seen up to 2018, it's still continuing now. So the major features of the uh, Strengthening Rural Decentralization Project, uh, which was mainly undertaken by a reformist faction of the left front, I must say, I will come back to this later. Uh, a major component of this was installation of participatory uh, village planning, much in the model of People's Plan com Campaign of Kerala. So there, there were exchange of ideas between the two states and both had communist governments at that point. So um, through time in intensive but flexible village level participatory planning processes, this project tried to strengthen the notions of organized and active citizenship. And I've shown through my research that the features of empowered participatory governance as Fung and Wright um, advocates, the concept of EPG, there are real similarities between the design and the functions of uh, APG and the way this was uh, undertaken. So, and another thing is that uh, when we look at how the global discourses of good governance was translated into state practices, it seemed that those uh, concepts of active citizenship, inclusive governance, closer state society linkage, it fitted comfortably with uh, this democratic deepening agenda of, a, again, I say, a reformist faction of the ruling left front. It was not the entire left front that was supporting it. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into details, but we can come back to it in the discussion part. But the reformist faction of the left front. So this is some of the way that this participatory planning was done. 
um, a natural resource map, a social resource map was uh, made through neighborhood meetings uh, as part of those planning exercises. Then there was pro proactive disclosure of information in the form of these maps and data prepared by the community, like collected and prepared by the community through uh, these exercises and displayed on a permanent structure within the village, like a school building or a primary health care center, uh, I, um, these kinds of structures. So during my interviews, um, I did 66 uh, interviews at the grassroots. So this uh, person who was, a, who was a member of the village uh, development committee, he said that now village development committees don't exist, but when it did, uh, we found it useful because we could all sit together and discuss amongst ourselves. So that means it gave them a sharing platform and it shows a kind of growing confidence because he says, I would not have learned to talk if I remained confined to my ward. So there was a networking taking place and also increased confidence about, because he says that previously I could not speak to the chairperson. I had, I felt that I had to respect that chair. I could not gather the courage to speak to him. After becoming a member of this um, and networking with other people from other words, I had that courage. I learned to talk, you know, so kind of, the impact I, as I perceived in my research was that it, it is very close to the EPG model of Hung and Rai. So it, it, I, can, I can say that it was a kind of EPG experiment and it demonstrated the potential to reforge relationships. It was, you know, cut off midway within five years, but it demonstrated the uh, potential to reforge the relationships between the people, the party and the local state. However, uh, so, because it threatened to open up the internal operation of the state to detailed public in interrogation, this, I, I think this caused nervousness among the bureaucrats and the local politicians. So that is why I say that the idea was supported by a reformist faction and not the entire uh, party machinery that was operating at that point. So if I go to the World Bank project that came in uh, 2011 to 18, so uh, it was a very copybook style. It, the features uh, included improved accounting practices, centralized monitoring and information sec, uh, system, annual perf performance assessment. So annual performance assessment is a kind of conditionality. So if you pass this performance indicator, the, these conditionalities, then you are the local government institution or the village council is eligible for the block grant given by the uh, World Bank. And the project is called institutional strengthening of gram panchayats. It was very technical in nature. It is, it is still very technical in nature. So all the local government institutions, they were given with advanced um, tech, uh, equipment, computerized, all accounting system was computerized. And uh, so this was a combination of detailed formal procedures and strong financial incentives which was not so much there in the DFID project. And it was a more technical approach. So I'll show you how. Uh, so this is the way the village plans are prepared now under the ISGP project. So if we just go back a few slides and com compare and contrast this with this picture. So this is how it is, the plan is now prepared within the office by bureaucrats through this software. So it is called uh, web-based planning and monitoring tool under the SGP project operated by local government officials and local bureaucrats. So they are, the local government officials are actually uh, trained in this by the ISGP uh, trainers, mentors, the field personnel working under ISGP. And um, so they don't have much scope to interact with the local politicians or the people's representatives or the community, which was happening under the SRD program funded by the DFID. So there the field personnel actually attended the village development committee meetings. Community members were in, invited to the uh, panchayats, to the village council for detailed training sessions. Regular review was taking place and a capacity building 
so the people's representatives or the community representatives also had a scope for capacity building and also the left front government also had inbuilt party mechanisms to build capacity of their own cadre so there was there was a kind of power sharing between the bureaucrats or the local government officials and the people's representatives so both attended these trainings and they they took the decisions together under the isgp because most of the trainings are imparted only to the local government officials and it's like they are telling the people's representatives that okay we'll take care of everything we are pre preparing the plan you don't have to do much but there will be efficient service delivery and it's much more infrastructural in nature like you'll get the road in front of your home you will get the pipeline water in your home don't worry about that we'll take care but they are not actually part of this decision making process so impact of the isgp project is much more strict and enforce enforcement of formal procedures and uh, technically advanced mechanisms which in effect you know uh, did away with this human touch and excluded the direct stakeholders from the decision making processes of the state as i said it shifted the power balance in favor of the local bureaucrats so I'll, i'll i'll give evidence in um, support of this because uh, because the people's representatives are no more included in the training sessions because it's supposed because many of them are not um, literate even so not educated to that level so it's it is assumed that they will not be able to take in that kind of a technical training so this power sharing there was previously during the left front regime it seemed to lose the political classes are seem to lose autonomy at the local level it is also true that the previous government the uh, during the left front regime they had much more control over the um, local government officials the political classes had much more control and it seems that the um, local government officials are now kind of enjoying this autonomy that they are able to run the institutions according to their wish their uh, or, or according to the rule book i i, I will say because uh, they say that the everything is there in the rule book previously there was interference from the community now the world bank project has given us this opportunity to run this according to the rule book but at, at the same time because the nature of this right populist regime is somewhat different so it does not have a regimented party structure it does not have that mechanism inbuilt mechanism to build capacity of its cadres working at the grassroots it depends much more on the bureaucrats and the uh, local government officials to function so therefore it it's it's more like a centralized leader at the state or at the district levels and then so the cadre base does not have much uh, authority political authority and this is being reinforced uh, by the funds that are coming in through the world bank so my feeling was that uh, my findings uh, is that of my research is that the project perfectly fitted the political deeds of the right populist regime which adopted a more conventional governance model of a centralized and authoritative state so this does not believe in much believe much in uh, participatory practices so that this course is not there it's all about service delivery a centralized leadership a centralized state authoritative state it will be done through oh, through our bureaucratic, bureaucratic machinery so the people don't have to worry about it why why involve them unnecessarily it's like that so uh, if if i take uh, um, a voice from the grassroots that is an engineering assistant of a uh, that is a local government official of a village council that i interviewed in 2017 so he says earlier if the political masters wanted to div divert funds and uh, carry out violation of prescribed guidelines so we had to listen to them but now these technical solutions are working to our advantage and providing us a safeguard so because we have convinced them that we cannot report wrongly in the web based reports we would be caught so um, 
so there's the less tendency to violate these schemes, but also at the same time, there's less flexibility. So there may be that the community may need to change their needs. So there's less scope for that. Again, uh, there's an, uh, this is another higher uh, mid-level bureaucrat. So the district panchayat and rural development officer, so local bureaucrat. So he is very, he, these, this class, the mid-level bureaucrats, they seem very happy with the ISGP project, the World Bank project, because they can see everything from the that central monitoring system. So it says monitoring the GP has become so easy these days. I can see everything from my office through the websites. So now the GPs are even uploading photographs of the schemes that they are implementing. Shortly, we can even see uh, the- Devjani, just one more minute for you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm done, I'm done. So we can, they can identify the gaps from their offices. So it's about, I, I feel that it's about different state practices. So one is about decent, different state practices leading to different implications. One is decentralization of state power, reaching out to citizens for forging effective state society linkage. One is recentralization of state power and a centralized govern, governance model working with formal procedures. So I have tried to uh, map this finding in this summary. So what's the vision on good governance Two different visions of good governance? It's impact of grass on grassroots. One is one has the potential to opening up spaces for enhanced engagement between state and the citizens. Other is building institutions, but excluding people. And uh, it, the final point that I want to make is that the state, it's not, it's not that only the development discourse of the development agencies, they are coming on and th that is the leading protagonist and they are doing all the changes. It's not like that. The local political context should also be taken into account. So how it is supported, complemented or resisted or facilitated by the local political actors. So we, we need to look at the different motivations and the different visions and uh, see who these visions appeal to and who they alienate. So it finally indicate that global ideas um, do play an important role in transforming institutional culture at the local level. The process is complex and multi-layered with several actors in the recipient countries playing a major role in contesting or reinforcing or facilitating the course of institutional change. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Devjani. That was very interesting. Um, and there are, I'm sure there are a lot of questions about the comparison of the two um, projects. We now move on to a very different case study. The uh, title of this presentation and paper is Straight to Norway, the creation of a best practice agenda for governing oil. Um, and there are three co-authors, co Sam, Giles, and myself. So over to you, Sam. You say in the screen, Sam. Hi, I'm Dean Giles. I just got. Uh, there we go. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody, and um, thanks, Farah. So, um, this is a paper that arises out of uh, an ECID funded project based at the University of Manchester, which focuses on natural resource governance among a number of new oil producers in Africa. So Sam and I are going to present, but as Farwa uh, said, uh, she's very much part of this paper, so she'll join us for the Q&A. Um, can the next slide, Sam, please? So yeah, so basically we're going to explore what the puzzle is, uh, where we think this fits into the rise of, of kind of good governance and the global oil agenda, we're going to do some analysis from a very brief kind of overview of the, of the work we've been doing uh, empirically and then tease out at the end, uh, which Sam will do, kind of the implications of that for this, for the themes of this uh, session around kind of policy transfer and the, and the political economy of that. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, uh, Sam. Uh, 
So in, in that in the in the broader project, we analysed five new producer countries uh, in Africa in terms of how effective a series of oil governance reforms have been, and it became apparent that all of them had to very to varying degrees adopted a remarkably similar set of institutions, and that those countries' political settlements were important for understanding the effectiveness of these reforms. So really picking up from the last point that Debjani made is that you know you can take sort of templated kind of policies, but actually how they play out in particular different political economy contexts uh, is really where the, the interesting work really lies. Um, and that phase of the research where we looked at that effectiveness really found that first of all, they haven't been a great success, these reforms, uh, which probably wasn't a great surprise. In terms of what actually happened, and we'll come back to this in a, a bit more detail, the accountability agenda um, had been championed much more than building regulatory capacity or even strengthening wider governance of which the oil governance was a part. And there was a, a bias against enhancing the role of national oil companies, what are called NOx, in that kind of mix of, of oil institutions. And I'm going to detail these institutional reforms in a little more detail in a minute, but it's been they've been described as the Norwegian model. Um, and I use those scare, scare quotes um, partly because many people don't see it as a model and certainly with the Norwegians we talked to don't see it as a model and then we'll come on to the reasons why they don't see it as a model in a highly prescriptive sense but certainly um, th this is what the common currency kind of terms these set of reforms yet Norway at the time that oil was discovered in the 60s was very different to most if not all new African producers which raises a very kind of massively big elephant in the room question about why um, uh, how appropriate these reforms are and why they're being promoted so widely. And this is a quote here on, on, on the screen from one of the, our respondents. Yeah, so the puzzle we want to probe is why did a model that some had already warned wouldn't work outside of Norway still get adopted by most of these new producers? Where did it come from and which institutions, ideas and interests were behind it? And our initial assumption really was that this was kind of same old, same old story of um, of disciplinary neoliberalism. It was donors foisting a kind of policy package in a very prescriptive way on relatively powerless recipient countries. But the reality was somewhat different, and that's what we want to really explore today. The next slide, please, Sam. So what we wanted to do then is to track the origins and movement of this oil governance agenda, to scrutinise the ideas and interests that underpin it. So those of you who know the ECID work is very much in, in keeping with, with the focus of the centre. We rooted our kind of analysis in some of the policy transfer and policy mobilities literature, particularly the latter, because I think it, it kind of gives us a more constructivist approach to look at how policy ideas are shaped by the multiple contexts through which they travel. Again, the kind of stuff that Deb Jani was, was giving us some really good detail on just now. We also use Tanya Murray Lee's work around disciplinary neoliberalism, because we think it gives you a, a kind of a more critical political economy take on kind of knowledge production and also emphasizes that some of the stuff we, we felt we were seeing about the lack of attention to local context in, in, in how those agendas are played out. And we've been interviewing some key actors in, in these uh, debates and reforms. Uh, we've been reviewing landmark policy declarations and various evaluation reports. We're about halfway through, so there is a kind of health warning that some of this is a bit tentative, but and really appreciate people's feedback to see if we're sort of making sense of it in the right way. Um, next slide, please, Sam. So at, at the start, I mentioned the Norwegian model, uh, the, global, the oil governance agenda, whatever we're going to call it. Um, not going to go into any detail. There's lots of stuff out there um, that you can find, um, but it has a number of kind of common features. I think probably the most predominant is this idea of separation of powers, that the, the commercial functions, the regulatory functions and the policy functions are separated out into a, into a, a kind of a national oil company, if that's what you've got, a regulator and the ministry. So this is key. People talk about the, the model, the separation model. Transparency and accountability, we have a big part of this. So in terms of, say, oil contracting, revenue generation, revenue spending, um, this is all made as public as possible. And EITI has been a part of that, as we will look at. Public financial management, again, same, you can imagine World Bank and IMF in particular have been pushing on, you know, strengthening the accounting and auditing systems and making that more transparent. And then there's been a whole set of cross-cutting emphasis on capacity building, whether that's human capacities or physical capacities, building buildings, IT systems, data storage facilities and the like. So what we're going to do now briefly in the middle part of the paper is just discuss the different actors in terms of who, who's been building this, this agenda. So the, my final slide before moving on to Sam is going to look at the, the Norwegians. And um, 
yeah, the, part of the reason the Norway model has such currency is that the Norwegian government via NORAD's Oil for Development program has been supporting many new producer countries, particularly in terms of the separating these powers, in terms of drafting the legislation, some of the TNA and, and, and PFM initiatives that I've just mentioned. So what we want to do is really to trace the, the origins of the Oil for Development program um, and, and how far it's sought to be sort of replicated in Africa. And when, when Norway started its own production of oil in the 1960s, it had very little expertise in oil and gas and was reliant on a, on a single ministry for all oil related activities. It was a small country, it was a maritime country, it realised that it, it had to work with the international oil companies or the IOCs uh, to, to extract this oil. And they were very ill-equipped at that time to actually deal with these big, you know, the big players. And then, you know, a turning point was an Iraqi geologist joined the, joined the Norwegian ministries in, in the 60s and brought with him a lot of experience of, of how Iraq had dealt with the IOCs, uh, particularly that need to protect sovereign rights in the face of corporate power. And I think this has been one of the kind of light motifs, if you like, of, of, of the Norwegian model. So they realize that you have to regulate fairly. So you have to you have to put up with these IOCs. They're going to they're going to try and play you. But the way you do that is you have your own national oil company. You have uh, a very robust and capable technocracy able to deal with that. And that's the kind of mantra that they, they, they kind of preach. You've got to regulate, but you've got to have capable people. Um, so that was the kind of Norway model. From the 80s and 90s then, uh, we, we were told by a number of people, they started to receive ad hoc requests from countries like Tanzania for assistance in trying to ha how to strengthen their, th those government sovereign rights in the face of multinational capital. So that initial engagement was very much, it was ad hoc, but it was demand driven in that sense. It, was, it wasn't Norwegians going out the flogging this model, there was demand from a number of African producer countries. Um, and this gradually morphed into the All for, for Development program. And we've got tons of stuff on this, and I, we haven't got time to detail it, but it, it becomes much more bureaucratic. It's tied into a number of Norwegian ministries, foreign affairs, energy, et cetera, et cetera, and becomes, um, some argued, uh, less responsive. But it's been a long-term engagement with a number of countries, which I think is, is, is key. It's under severe pressure at the moment from the climate agenda. Should you be promoting oil and development? Should it be energy and development? So there's a big debate going on in Norway and beyond around that, but that's the kind of different issue at the moment. Um, and one of the things which, which Sam will pick up on is it, it, it's very much about uh, a civil servant to civil servant model of embedded relations, which African ministries across all the countries we studied really kind of appreciated. So that's the kind of Norway part of the story. I'm gonna to pass to Sam now, who's gonna pick up on some of the other actors. Great, thanks, Giles. Um, so the um, Giles has talked about the Norway elements of the oil governance agenda that emerged over the 2000s. And in terms of the other aspects that he identified um, around public financial management, transparency and accountability, uh, there's clear uh, continuities here with the broader good governance agenda, which Deb Jani has already flagged for us. Uh, both in terms of its neoliberal bias towards unbundling and limiting state involvement and its affinity with liberal democratic norms uh, and institutional arrangements. Uh, but there's also a more particular history uh, to um, uh, the, the particular oil governance agenda that emerged over the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, which around a set of um, academics, uh, international NGOs and uh, IFIs uh, became a, a mini epistemic community of the type that we're now familiar with, uh, it, its involvement within the spread of global policy ideas, uh, with Norway as a central influence but also a somewhat semi-detached player in this process. So what you see over the late 1990s is a growing uh, research but also journalistic pieces on the problems associated with a lack of transparency in the oil sector. NGOs like uh, Global Witness, Human Rights Watch, Oxfam America um, uh, lead um, George Soros uh, to establish the Revenue Watch Fund under his Open Society initiative to investigate the flow of finances from oil companies to governments. There's a civil society campaign around publish what you pay, um, drawn together in a global witness report around alleged mismanagement of oil in Angola. Uh, and you see a range of other political players in the Global North get on board this agenda, including Tony Blair, who wanted to have something to say in Johannesburg when he visited in 2002, um, which then leads on uh, back to the EITI initiative 
uh, the story of which is being told a, a lot in the literature. We won't really play it here. Uh, and that initiative is, is obviously housed in Oslo, the link back to Norway. But partnership with academics here was really critical, many of whom were based on the East Coast at uh, Columbia University, uh, Jeff Sachs's Earth Institute, Joe Stiglitz uh, Institute for Policy Dialogue, uh, which joined forces with the Revenue Watch Institute and Open Society Institute uh, to publish Escaping the Resource Curse, the book you see there in 2007, and essentially a how-to guide. Literally, the chapters are, are, are how-to um, auction oil rights, how to handle the macroeconomics of oil wealth, how to uh, ensure a transparent fiscal contract and described by an expert in the field has been highly influential on the formation of a new agenda. Paul Collier is thanked in the foreword to this book for his work and Collier sets up an, uh, an alternative strand using some of the same uh, practitioners who he invites to his um, his getaway in France in the French countryside and over three or four days with Tony Venables, um, Karen Lissakers and other uh, technically uh, well-informed people come up with what will be the um, natural resource charter which you see there. A set of principles by governments and societies on how to best harness the opportunities created by extractive resources. Funded in part by a grant from NORAD, which is funneled through the University of Oxford, where Tony Venables is the BP chair. And the charter is launched in a number of places, including Oslo, and then taken on the road to Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania, where Collier delivers um, a series of highly bespoke uh, talks on how this general charter applies to the specifics of these countries. Uh, you can more or less exchange the, the title of different countries in these talks. Um, the final set of players here, were, uh, final players were the IFIs in this epistemic um, community. And in fact, the Natural Resource Charter is first launched and to join the IFI meeting in 2010. Um, and you have um, here within the World Bank in particular, the World Bank has previously turned a blind eye to the extractives industry, uh, perhaps having its fingers burnt by the fallout from the Chad Cameroon pipeline, which it sought to get involved in um, and had disastrous governments, environmental, social um, impacts. Um, and most issues within the, uh, around the extractors had been dealt with by the oil, gas and mining uh, unit, uh, which was uh, offered uh, lending and TA support for the extractives in the Global South. In 2010, uh, they established a, a new initiative called Governance and Extractive Industries, uh, lo located not in the lending or powerful policy side of the bank, but in the World Bank Institute, the learning think tank side of the bank. Um, and as one key player there highlights with that quote, that governance folk in the bank were looking to take on new fields and they were influenced by, guess who, who was uh, obviously at the World Bank between 98 and 2003 in the economic research department, uh, and who was th at that stage writing a lot about natural resources. Uh, the World Bank didn't seek to challenge Norway's hegemony here. They were um, strongly influenced by Norway. They were influenced by some East Coast uh, NGOs, but were also not able to take on a full civil society agenda, given their government to government approach and the need to do business with um, governments. And some of these issues directly informed the extent to which the World Bank really was, as the language of disciplinary neoliberalism would suggest, really was intent on foisting a certain set of institutional arrangements on uh, countries in the uh, um, global south. Um, move, so let, let's, let's have a think about this from an analytical perspective and then uh, read through some of the World Bank's activities from uh, Tanya Murray-Lee's lens. Uh, this is an approach uh, which, as Giles flagged, has been used to track uh, the spread of global policy transfers. Uh, Jeremy Seekings and myself used it to analyse the spread of cash transfers in the south. And she basically mobilizes all the great and good of, of Western social theory, uh, Marx, uh, uh, Gramsci and Foucault uh, to understand this. Um, but we also argue that you need to understand not just political economy, ideology and governmentality. You also need to understand the internal life worlds of um, development organizations and the ways in which particular interests um, lie behind the policy models that are promoted 
and how that actually informs their engagements with um, uh, governments in the global south around the oil governance agenda. Um, so what do we get um, from an ideological perspective? As Giles has hinted from our initial findings on what was happening on the ground, you have a fairly narrow um, epistemological agenda around uh, what oil governance should consist of in the global south. Um, you had a major publication on national oil companies and value creation from the World Bank, uh, which denigrated the role of Knox and pretty much ruled out a, a role for them, a productive role for them within the global south. Um, and that was at the, the extreme end. There is, there is some variation when you get to the, 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 the main um, uh, civil society player at the moment, the NRGI, they, they are much more accepting of the need to invest in government capacity to manage um, international oil companies. There is a degree of openness to supporting uh, national oil companies. And this is somewhat stronger the further you move across, say, to NORAN in the Oil for Development programme. Uh, there is um, uh, a lot of direct support for state sovereignty, especially by regulatory oversight. Um, but less direct support for national oil um, corporations. We only really find um, particular academics and particular organisations. There's a group that Chatham House supports called the New Producers Group, uh, led by Valerie Marcel, which actively convenes technocrats from national oil companies and regulatory authorities and tries to support their role um, in uh, being a more productive value added role. There's also arguably a racialized politics to this. Jemima Pierre has argued that uh, the whole discourse of uh, natural, uh, the natural resource curse um, and the foisting of the Norway agenda on countries like Ghana is inherently racist, um, tied to a, a world system that wants to deny African state sovereignty and place their priorities below those of Western NGOs, corporations and international organizations. And we certainly see a strong continuity here um, around with strong echoes of the era of extractive imperialism. Uh, we do think it's a little bit more complicated though. Um, African leaders themselves have been highly um, uh, vocal about wanting to avoid becoming the next Nigeria um, for their own reasons around fear of instability and development failure, which would lead to declining political legitimacy. Um, and some have actively support capacity building support, not just from Norway and the bank, uh, but also from uh, Global South counterparts, from Petrobras in Brazil, from, from India, from Trinidad, from a whole range of other actors. So it's not quite as straightforward. And I guess the, the empirical question is the extent to which um, African elites genuinely use all resources for the, uh, for the national good, as opposed to um, entering into comprador politics here. Um, uh, so we will we'll continue to track this. Um, governmentality wise, we certainly see a familiar set of standard techniques here, whereby a particular set of processes is rendered technical and improvable through identification of a certain set of institutional fixes that can be sold through various discursive strategies, including rock star uh, academics. And um, we find that we find the, the same tools and techniques, uh, the norms and metrics and so on. But we wonder if it really has the same teeth in a sector with such powerful interests, whether corporate or political here. And we don't find that this, the overbearing power of discipline and neoliberalism here really had a huge degree of impact on national level negotiations or state practices for following on from uh, the creation of these as benching frameworks. Where we do find a great deal of influence is around the institutional interests and practices. Uh, and I come back here to the division within the World Bank um, between the new governance uh, of extractive industries, um, think tank part of the bank and the longer standing oil, gas and mining. And when it came to influence within country, uh, the oil, gas and mining people would fly in their um, industry specialists and they would have a direct analogue with in-country economists, whereas the token governance person, in their own words, weren't a core part of bank support and didn't have an extractive industries analogue within country office teams. The OGM units were strongly informed by people with industry experience with the internationals and were 
less championing of the national oil companies, certainly compared to Norway. And the governance people within the bank weren't really playing the same accountability game. They were essentially rolling out the same fiscal management and regulatory work that the bank had always done um, uh, across uh, sub-Saharan Africa in the last 25 years. So very little new or difference here uh, around uh, certainly the accountability agenda. We also find institutional interests at play in the case of Norway. And although the official line as given there is that Norway will give its advice and support irrespective of whether its own organisations, Equinor, but also other um, state-owned oil enterprises have direct interests in these countries in the global south with strict walls between them. We also found from our interviews on the ground with African officials and with other people who knew how Norway operated, um, that uh, the, the, these Norway's commercials interests did frequently muddy the waters of the advice that was given and deepen the reluctance to offer support for national oil companies. Um, so where do, where, do we, where do we get to here um, in terms of our overall, what does our case offer us to our debates around um, national, uh, around the politics of policy transfer? Um, so we think what we're offering here is a partial rereading of, of policy transfer uh, during the era of disciplinary uh, neoliberalism. Uh, we find, as Giles has pointed out, um, some southern, southern influence on the whole agenda from Iraq is critical at the outset, and it's a resource nationalist, not a neoliberal influence. We see some solidarity in the early South-South exchanges and to some extent the more informal bilateral links between Norway and long-standing um, partnerships with Tanzania, Mozambique and so on. But this progressively becomes diluted and more technocratic and neoliberalised as Norway has an export uh, to sell uh, during the mid-2000s on a different type of agenda uh, takes over here, a thinner, if you like, more liberal rather than social democratic uh, agenda. And we find it's only weakly promoted in any case by a somewhat tired and conflicted uh, World Bank, uh, even when it does get on board with this. Um, perhaps because the era of good governance is kind of dying out uh, during this period as well. We do think institutional interests and pra uh, practices are critical here. It's important to dig a, a bit deeper than broad discourses here and look at actually how institutions work and how they, they're able to present coherent world views uh, on the ground. And it's striking that the epistemic community that seemed to be strong towards the mid end of the 2000s has essentially moved on. Collier is on to other issues, annoying other um, um, epistemic crowds around uh, his latest pontifications. Civil society has moved on um, to environmental concerns. There's not an awful lot of strength and power holding the accountability agenda together uh, as there might have been earlier. And finally, that the, the limited near, uh, range of ideas and the sense of productive incoherence here that Grabel and others have pointed out elsewhere has undermined the, the power of disciplinary neoliberalism. But with little direct support for any alternatives to it in the form of stronger status-led forms of resource nationalism, there's been limited take up from this. And it's not just a global picture as we showed in our other work that we presented last DSA and you can, you can get the working paper from us. It's also limited by the nature of governing coalitions, uh, which are unable very often due to uh, levels of elite fragmentation to commit to a longer term agenda of, of resource nationalism. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. Um, and if I can revert back to um, convener mode briefly, Fawa. Um, Ollie is here, but let me have a quick chat with him offline uh, as to whether or not he should give his paper now, given that uh, I understand he uh, thought it was going to be tomorrow. Um, and so maybe you can have questions on the first couple of papers while Ollie and I have a chat. All right, okay, that's fine. Okay, so I, I guess we can now open the floor for questions. Um, and maybe as chair, I'll exploit my position and go first. So if you have any questions, please either start typing them in chat or you could just um, raise your hand or actually just step in. So I had a question for Dave Jani. Um, thank you, that was a very um, interesting presentation. 
Um, and I and I think there is a lot there which maybe you didn't have time to discuss as well because it seems like a lot of work was put into it. So my question is actually on, um, you know, the this uh, transition from a DFID um, model to a World Bank model. And as I understood it, uh, there is a change of governments from a reformist government to a right wing government. But as you said that the both the models had a design or a participation element from the reformist government. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk about the implications of that, because, you know, there is this model which is being, um, which is perhaps external, but it has government involvement and it moves from a left wing or reformist government to the right wing. What does that mean in terms of policy? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I think the main thing that came out of my research was it was a very much uh, when I looked at the motivations of it all, the the bureaucratic agenda came out as a very important component for both the projects. But in the first case, in the DFID case, there was this support from the left left front regime. Uh, have when when they saw how people's plan campaign is panning out in Kerala. So a bunch of bureaucrats were sent to Kerala to have an exchange of ideas. And also in West Bengal before, uh, say in the 1980s, the left front government had carried on some participatory planning experiments in some pockets of the state. So they wanted uh, not, I would not, again, not they, it's a reformist faction of the left front who wanted to uh, upscale those experiments throughout the state, but they did not have the uh, funding for that. So when David came in uh, after 2000, uh, they saw this as an opportunity to replicate the Kerala model in West Bengal uh, with more funds. But they, they depended on a team of bureaucrats in the local government department at the state level, highest level, uh, to design this program. So DFID offered consultancy, but um, they said that, no, we understand the context and we will design it. Now, when DFID funds was coming to an end, they wanted to continue with uh, you know, institution building aspects. Uh, so. DFID program had taken care of the participatory planning at the village level, but the, they felt that the institution building uh, kind of had been left out of the agenda. So when uh, DFID was uh, going out, uh, but World Bank expressed their interest, uh, they decided to go on with that. But World Bank refused to fund the community level interventions. And they said that we have it inbuilt in our program. So, uh, and whatever we have inbuilt in our program, we will continue with that. That turned out to be formal procedures. Now, meanwhile, the government changed and that same team who designed it originally did not, was not there to take it up with World Bank to continue with the community level intervention. So, uh, that was how it was designed there, but they could not continue uh, and it, and the World Bank came in more forcefully than the than uh, like DFID was not so um, DFID operated much more in a partnership mode I would say, but for when World Bank came in it was much more imposing. Okay, thanks, thanks, Johnny. That that may not be the right word to use, but okay. Kind of. Okay, uh, Kate. You're next. Thanks. Yeah, my question is also for Deb Jani. It kind of follows up um, about the differences between those two programs. And um, in the context of how you describe decentralization as being sort of guided from above, but also aiming to involve um, local people and sort of local structures um, in what I understood to be a sort of potentially contesting um, the existing structure. So that immediately seems to have a tension if it's kind of there's a top down influence, but that it's trying to engage people, but maybe being a bit resistant to, um, uh, to challenge. So both of the models, um, uh, although they, you know, they were quite different um, and involved the local actors in different ways. Um, but I was wondering, um, like even in the differed version where the citizens were involved in the participatory process, it 
seemed like they were almost being in, incorporated into a kind of um, uh, existing structure. It, I didn't, I, I wasn't sort of seeing um, uh, opportunities or instances of kind of resistance or um, uh, pushback. And, and in the example of the World Bank, where the bureaucrats sort of took on the power and um, are taking power away from the political actors again. Um, I guess my question is, were there examples of resistance um, from any of the, the actors involved in these processes or was it, did it feel like sort of going through the motions um, and being involved in, um, in processes that were already set out rather than creating actually a sort of um, contestation, which seemed to be part of the, the aim of it, but it didn't really necessarily play out in, in how it worked. So uh, thank you for your question. Do you mean push back to the state practices, to the state uh, actors? Um, yeah, and also, um, for example, in the World Bank model, you know, with the if the bureaucrats were in charge, were they really delivering things that citizens wanted and needed? Were they were responding to demand? I guess it's those kind of interactions. If you're talking about building state citizen relations, mm. was that really happening, or was it sort of on paper? Yeah, so so in the DFID model, during the participatory planning exercises, there was th that was giving the uh, community, the villagers, a kind of platform to at least sit together and discuss their needs and priorities. And um, it was time consuming. Uh, so the bureaucrats, I think, on the other hand, one thing is it was not an, on their agenda because the funding was meager. It was not coming directly to the bureaucrats, it was more flowing to the local village councils. And the village development committees had opened an account, so they were getting some funding from uh, different. So bureaucrats were not interested. First of all, it was not on their agenda. They did not understand much what was going on in the villages. So there was kind of uh, a doubt in their mind uh, that we don't understand and whatever we don't understand we don't like so that that was a kind of thing that coming from the bureaucrats at the community level what i found now that they could not express uh, then they did not have any channel to express it to the upper levels at that point of time but now they say that now we are being asked we can say that it was valuable but for us and i sense that there was also a pushback from them to the local government institutions because they were being able to see how the state operates in a camouflaged manner in some cases. Even if it's the village council, there was a kind of tension building up between the local local bureaucrats and them. So for example, the local bureaucrats were not liking it uh, that a community representative will come up to them and uh, or the villagers will come up to them and say that we we know now that this is uh, we are entitled to such and such scheme why are we not getting this so the local bureaucrats did not like that so the entire defeat program did not have the support of the local bureaucrats and secondly out at the political level also the lowest level of cadres were starting to question their own party leaders right so that is why I'm saying repeatedly saying that the reformist faction falls for it, but the most major majority of the left front who at the first beginning thought that this is an ideal opportunity to get in, in increased political control over the local government institutions and consolidate our political control. They were somewhat taken aback after the project operated for the two, three years. And they saw that our cadres are questioning our how we function. So that was- okay, Thanks, uh, thanks, Jitani. Let thanks me just, just um, pass the question. Maybe they have, there are more questions. Uh, Sam, do you want to go first or should we get, get Lydia to go first? Lydia, please. Thanks. So this is, uh, I guess, uh, a comment, uh, but also then a question uh, for Devjana. Uh, I guess the comment on both papers uh, is that it seems to me that the papers show that uh, these processes of transfer and translation of models and, and ideas are happening at different levels and in nonlinear ways, right? So 
So this is not just about transferring from one agency to a country, from one country to another, but there's also processes of transfer and translation within institutions and within um, the countries that are, that uh, that provide those models and ideas. So I, I think there's there's it's it's interesting to ask uh, what's what donor agencies are translating themselves when they produce their good government governance agenda and how this translation process is influenced by either domestic politics in the case of of uh, bilateral donors but institutional politics and and other considerations for for IFIs and I think there's been insufficient attention on this process of formation of those models and concepts and accountability at that level in the northern development industry. I think it might be a little bit different in southern uh, cooperation, because often southern cooperation, south, south cooperation is based on policies that have already been ex been attempted in the uh, in the in the provider country, so they have already been subject to some uh, to some assessment. Uh, but but in the case of uh, of the northern development industry, often good governance agendas and other agendas for development build on abstract, often theoretical ideas on, of best practice rather than tested uh, tested uh, tested cases. Um, so I guess my question for the Jan, I don't know whether you've had the chance to. Uh, look deep inside the uh, DFID uh, framing of good governance, perhaps this was outside the scope of your work, but, uh, but I, I was wondering how much of this uh, and what arrives in India from DFID and our FCDO is, is shaped by prevailing domestic uh, views on the state and big society, the Tories' views on, 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 on the state society relations, and how much of it is based by a UK based in international development industry that is putting the emphasis on participation and a series of tools and uh, uh, concepts that it helped generating. So I'm just wondering how much of these, the, these processes of translation that go on within, uh, within the UK itself on the good governance agenda are visible when they arrive in India, or, or perhaps they're not at all, because I, I, I don't know. But I wonder whether you can share any reflections, even if your work hasn't specifically focused on uh, these two sources of, um, of, no, uh, of ideas. One thing is, it, it, you're right that I did not have too much scope to, you know, scope to go too much deeper into this aspect but uh, another thing is what we see now the changes that we see now happening in international development scenario in uk was very different in 2005 or 2003 and 4 when uh, they went in it was you know defeat was operating in full force in several departments in in several states of india at the at that time so uh, uh, the last the last document that I used in my PhD was dated 2010, starting from 1997 to 2010. I scanned some reports. Through those reports, these discourses come in, which which has I have seen playing out in India at that point of time. But after that, you know what has happened in UK later than that, I don't see. I haven't gone into the reflection of those. Uh, you know, the translation of those ideas into the grassroots. So I won't be able to give you an updated version of this. Thanks a lot, um, Devjani and Lydia for the question. So we have a question for from Indrajit, and then we also have Laura um, who wants to ask a question. So maybe we can take um, Indrajit's question first, which is, um, is there any evidence of policy transfer, knowledge transfer from your cases to the World Bank, DFID, uh, NORAD? So this is on the Norway model. Uh, and I don't know if Sam or Giles wants, who wants to take it? Should we take Laura's as well or? Um... Yeah, actually maybe we should. Um, Laura, please. Well, thank you so much. It has been fascinating 
morning from early morning for me. Um, I was just wondering because both both conversations, at least the way I, I heard, speak to the kind of competing global models or models that are becoming global. And th there are, you know, the, the, the kind of policy mobilities are interesting because it really allows for those competing ideas of whatever good governance is or uh, oil governance. So I was just wondering, uh, my question would be for uh, Sam and, and, and his uh, team, <laughs> colleagues, um, how about the so-called Latin American model uh, in terms of you know the oil producers, they're not necessarily they're also global southern countries, global south countries, but they have been discussing different kind of oil governance in a way that it's not necessarily um, the same way that you know African countries have been discussing this. So there are um, I'm not only I mean you've mentioned Brazil for instance, but I'm I'm really thinking here about uh, Venezuela and Ecuador and you know all, other kinds of you know oil uh, governance. So I was just wondering whether they fit in the conversation at all. I mean whether you could trace them, their presence or uh, their discourses about what good governance is. And it's I mean part of this discussion it's really about. Um, at least at the value level, people's governance of oil, you know, the, the, the very kind of Latin American discussion about um, ownership and, and what it means to this discussion. So I was just wondering whether it was visible at all in your research. Do you want to go first, Charles? Or? Um, yeah, I'll have a, I mean, uh, oh, yeah, I'm a miss. Um, I mean, in terms of Indigit's question i mean uh, sam did different interviews to me um i don't think there was much evidence really of of that policy transfer going in the other direction i mean i think despite talking to very lovely colleagues in in ofd i mean they were they kept saying we're not we're not selling a model this is not a model that we we give advice and they can take it or leave it there still seems to be very little kind of scope for, for anything but really and you know that's based in and, and then it played out on the ground in that way um, you know, we asked about political context, whether they had a kind of how they played into local institutions, were they aware of that, how did they do it? and you know there was never there was kind of generally a kind of quite technocratic answer of like okay we're aware of the politics but it was a, it was an imp impediment and we had to work around it kind of thing and you know. So my sense was, but I don't know whether Sam got a different sense that it wasn't really much reverse kind of flow of knowledge south to north in any way. Um, I mean, we did see the African Development Bank was a slightly different player, as, as Sam hinted at, in the sense of it was more prepared to work with the agendas of the other Af the other the new producer countries in in sense of you know they were slightly less biased against the national oil companies. Certainly, there was an ideological, and I think you know competitive element to not wanting to build up Knox um, because they were against a free market model and they were competitors with the IOCs from those same countries. So. There was those kind of things, but not a sense in, in, of, of a reverse kind of flow, really. Um. Yeah, um, I mean, a couple of things, on, starting with Lydia's comments as well, that I think it, there, there are actually quite a few similarities with with, uh, with South South in terms of the level of solidarity involved mm. and the extent to which it was, it was first trialled. So this was, obviously it's a Norway model, it was tried and trusted in the North before it was then exported further south and there was an element of it being demand rather than supply led so it was the finance minister of Tanzania who calls his counterpart in Norway initially to ask for the support um, and the the bureaucrat to bureaucrat thing the fact that Norway wasn't a colonial power and they played on this as well there's elements of mm. of what we're seeing now and what we'll talk about more in your session tomorrow Plus the fact that this is an agenda which starts in the south. It's an Iraqi geologist who's seen the damage that IOCs do to his country and doesn't want his adopted country, once he marries a Norwegian, to um, to fall through, through, through the same problems. And as you know, the Norway we're about to. I mean, it's really interesting. I'm, sorry, I was I, I may have been on the phone to Ollie at the time when Giles was talking about OFD, but it was um, uh, the. The Norwegians were about to get ripped off. The IOCs were hiding it deep in their reports, you know, how serious the oil fines were in Norway. And it took someone with Farouk's training to tell them to read the reports properly and say, you've got, you know, you've got wealth for generations here. You can't let the IOCs have it. Um, so there's some solidarity there. Um, it's not like, and this comes to both Laura's and um, um, Indrajit's points, it's not similar to, say, the cash transfers idea, which clearly has its origins in 
the Mexico Brazilian success, and then the bank hoovers it up and, and splurges it back out uh, in, in sub Saharan Africa along with DFID uh, and, and others. Um, the bits that they export are things which they think are good things around good governance. They don't allow any learning to infiltrate and no, uh, from the south. And what's really striking here is that Norway um, doesn't just learn from those other countries, but it doesn't encourage that any of that horizontal learning. Yeah. So when it goes into countries, it brings its own technocrats and there's a big Norwegian industry now. People who used to work for OFD and have now become consultants. And it's a kind of supply rather than demand led form of advice to countries now. Um, and what they don't do is say, well, actually, look at this case, look at how Indonesia did it a bit differently. They didn't unbundle straight away. They did something else with that uh, and, and so on. They never do that. They talk about the Norway model and share it. And it's great. There is an equal exchange of, of type there, but there's no attempt to contextualize it within what's actually happened in the last 30 years of oil produ production in Latin America, in Southeast Asia and allow you know for that horizontal learning and when we asked the OFD technocrats they were like oh no no we didn't do that actually it just it just hadn't occurred um so that, that was interesting so no just really GNPC modeling themselves on Petrobras I think was as far as we got with the, the Latin American uh, model Um, thanks a lot, Laura, for your question. Um, I think there is a there's a lot there in terms of uh, future research. Um, but yeah, I think um, maybe we should move on to Ollie's presentation um, because it's 18 past. Uh, so I think, yeah, so I think I'll hand over to the floor to Ollie. And so we're actually moving from India to Norway and now to Nigeria and his and Ifan Yechukwe's paper is titled, How do ideas move and what moves them? Tax policy innovations in federal Nigeria. So over to you, Oli. Thanks ever so much for that. Um, and thanks Sam for uh, nudging me to be ready because uh, he narrowly averted disaster in that I had this written tomorrow. I'm so sorry, I'm so stupid. This is one of the risks of online conferences, I think, when people like me don't write stuff down right. Luckily, it's in the same time zone as I am. Otherwise, you should have seen what happened with one that was in Finland when you have to work it all out. Anyway, this is all good. So thank you for joining. So it's going to be a bit scrappier because I'm not with the PowerPoint presentation that we're working on and I've not been able to get hold of Fanny. Um, so this is going to be a little bit from kind of reconstructed. It's going to be a bit more of a talk through the paper. Um, I'll try and share one or two graphics from a, a working paper that I've drawn on here. Um, but basically, Basically, I think, you know, what got me interested in this is it's a kind of essay about two things. It's an essay about kind of Nigeria 2.0 in transition from being this kind of classic example of a kind of rentier centralized oil state, which is federalized, but not federalized fiscally. Um, that's one part of the story. And another part of the story is about us as kind of development people and what we are prepared to see and what we're not prepared to see. You know, what looms large to us in the landscape because we're expecting it and looking for it and what doesn't and takes a little bit more work to recognize. Can everybody hear me and follow me okay? Okay, great. So, and this is also, you know, cards on the table. Um, this is a kind of autoethnography as well, because I'm involved in this field as a practitioner. So for the last three years, I've been working with the International Center for Tax and Development in IDS in Sussex um, as the research director of the Nigeria Tax Research Network, um, which involves, brings together Nigerian stakeholders, and which I'll talk about a bit. So this is a little bit me thinking through what I've been doing and trying to do two jobs at once, trying to do, you know, the kind of, practitioner doing a job and trying to also take a critical step back and say like what is this that I'm actually doing what really fascinated me and got me into this question and looking at it more critically is why the bits that I expected to move fast didn't move fast and why the bits that I didn't did and that was really the kind of challenge that kind of brought me to thinking about it in a more academic way so I think I'm going to do a couple of things I'm going to contextualize about uh, Nigeria um, revenue uh, devolution the political economy and the politics uh, and then I'm going to talk through the different ways in which people have tried to work with policy transfer around tax and revenue. And this is going to be domestic tax and revenue rather than international tax and revenue, although that's a thing that's a conversation that's also being had around IFS and around, um, around international kind of transaction taxes. But I'm going to talk about domestic taxation. So then I'm going to go through these kind of four groups of policy actors and how things have worked. And I'm going to come to a couple of preliminary conclusions, three maybe. Um, but just to recap on the revenue, I'm going to go through in 2019, I did a bit of research 
um, with a colleague, Sarah Burns in Oxford, um, who's a proper economist to kind of put numbers together. And I just look at them and say, is there a story to these numbers? Anyway, so we worked together and we managed to make a thing that seemed relatively coherent and which we kind of took to audiences in Nigeria who seemed to think it told a story that was interesting and coherent. So, and it's a piece of work that I'm sure could be doing much more thoroughly by someone who did a much better job, but I should also give credit to Nigeria's Federal Inland Revenue Service and Bureau of Statistics, because Nigeria used to be a kind of data holder, you know, you just couldn't get public data in. These public bodies have been really forthcoming with increasingly accurate data that makes it much easier to do kind of collaborative research like this. So I should um, plug and thank them for that at the beginning. But the basic findings of this 2019 paper that we did on revenue were that, um, you know, we've been talking about Nigeria's post-oil future for a while, but it's actually a present reality because in 2015, for the first time since 1971, Nigeria's public finances already earned more from non-oil sources than from oil. So this post-oil future actually already happened. And that transformation came from a rise in non-oil tax collection and a decline in oil prices and thus revenue. So it's one line going up and another line going down. Uh, in the last year that we used data from, which then I think was 20. 16, the federal government relied on oil income for 47% of its revenues. And this is, you know, you'll see these kind of uh, unsourced quotes about Nigeria that relies 85% on oil revenue, you know, and sometimes people are talking about foreign exchange, sometimes they're talking about exports, but it's clearly not actually the case for revenue, you know. If you were to look at comparators, we're kind of on our way to Mexico, you know. This is, you know, the dominant sector because it's the biggest single sector, but it's not the biggest sector. Um, in terms of its contribution. Um, I guess, in a, you know, federal government collects uh, about 5.5% of GDP and revenue, but if you include state governments, it rises to 6.3%. Uh, and this is kind of important because there's a cut up. Federal government to massively oversimplify collects corporate income taxes and oil taxes. State governments collect personal income taxes Property taxes are sort of spread between state government and local government. These are the three constitutional levels in Nigeria. So we came up with this tax to the GDP ratio of 6.27%, which we know is a bit of an underestimation because there's a plus N about things that we don't know how they're collected. But it shows that two things. One, it shows that, you know, in comparison to similar sized economies, we could say that Nigeria is undertaxed. But equally, that doesn't mean that Nigerians are undertaxed because of course the burden falls differently on some people than others. And because we don't really know, and we're trying to commission research into currently, what else Nigerians are paying for in kind of tax-like payments, you know, service fees, informal kind of taxation, and all of this. So, you know, you can say that there is this tax gap, but we don't know what it expands into if people are trying to expand it, and whether there's a kind of tolerance for that. And of course, with economic downturn, you know, you, you think about people being affected differently. So that kind of throws up a kind of factoid that can be used in two ways, I guess, um, depending on the kind of politics of looking at tax. So revenue collection has been seen a big rise in non-oil taxes in nominal terms. You know, the, 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 the revenue bodies being told go out there and collect tax and that's happened, but there's been currency depreciation. So in nominal terms, there's been this growth, but in real terms, you know, oil revenues have declined, currency depreciated. So it's kind of held the line. Um, and the other interesting thing that we found is that while this is actually happening in the figures, kind of core institutions and policies continue to lag behind. The kind of constitutional setup that we seem to be working with, the institutional design and the policy assumptions are of kind of Nigeria 1.0, which is this, you know, oil rich, well funded state. And yet, of course, we had this, you know, huge tipping point midway through last year, in March last year, when oil actually became negatively priced. You know, you literally had to pay people to take it away. And this was, you know, a huge shock to the, you know, the cash flow and also I think to the system. So, this is our 2019 paper where we're saying this is not yet on people's agenda in terms of the way they think about institutions. Maybe that's already getting a bit outdated because of that series of events. And now people are more consciously realizing that there's an institutional transformation that's been kind of foisted upon the country. And that's interesting because it ties into, it, that's a technocratic kind of conversation about about institutional design and policy, but it's also a very, very heated public conversation about devolution which is always coming back on the agenda in Nigeria. And it comes back in our, all forms from a constitutional conversation to a very radicalized conversation, you know, through the politics of security in the street and all kinds of things. So, you know, there is this kind of dried out data-driven version. And there's also the very, very kind of fertile public conversation. So this is right, I think, at the heart of a lot of, of uh, conversations that are happening, but in a slightly different place. 
So um, in terms of the ways that the policy transfer kind of conversation has gone, I think there are four sets of actors that have been important. One is central government actors, which is mainly devolved on the Federal Inland Revenue Service of Nigeria, um, which also coordinates a thing called the Joint Tax Board, which brings together state um, you know, revenue services and also brings the Ministry of Finance, you know, the, the kind of cluster of technocratic institutions around finance and that that i guess has the strengths and weaknesses of a major central government institution you know the main strength being it's a big actor and therefore when it does stuff that's transformative stuff that changes the landscape and the weakness being the corollary of that which is that it's not a particularly nimble actor you know it, 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 things have to go through a lot of conversation a lot of coordination with other agencies you know things are signed off at a very high level and so when things do happen they're big but they're not necessarily that reactive and this is a federal country so there's a lot of local manifestation there's a lot of local implementation there's a lot of local variation which means that a lot of the kind of space for innovation gets pushed actually to state governments and i think it helps to think of nigeria's federal system at least economically as a a differentiated, variegated bunch of middle income and low income small countries, and if you think about it like that, sharing a common administrative system. So Lagos is a very different place from Kebbi State, you know, the economic basis are very different, the kind of triggers of public debate are very different, even people's kind of consensual ideas about what constitutes the, the grounds of political conversation to reference the question that was just asked about people's oil and you know how people think about things very much varies across the country kind of culturally and, and and to do with the kind of political roots of debate so um we talk about state governments but before we get to state governments um no actually let's deal with state governments the interesting thing about state governments in nigeria is that um, as well as having a kind of link to federal government through the constitutional organs, through funding organs, through um, a thing called the National Economic Council, which is shared by the vice president, the most powerful kind of forum in which they work together, there's a thing called the Nigeria Governors Forum, um, which often kind of leads on collective statements that state governments have about, you know, how they would like to relate to the federal level, collective statements about issues of priority or urgent national issues, and also has a research department and plays a kind of policy coordination role between peers. The most interesting thing I think about Nigeria Governors Forum, which has been around for quite a long time and is now quite a solid part of the landscape, is that it's an NGO. It's not a constitutional organ. It's almost, it's an NGO, it's a registered NGO, which is a union of state governments. So it's, it's a registered NGO made of government. I mean, that is, you know, which I, I just love as the challenge that that gives us to our kind of classical ideas about sovereignty and what's the state and what isn't the state. You know, this is the kind of driver of a lot of conversation at NGO made of government. Um, and so NGF brings people together in partnership. It has policy conversations, it identifies areas in which research is needed. It tries to kind of coordinate the level of data that's available. It tries to review progress in different areas. And it's also tried to kind of pin colors to the mast, I guess, in terms of common aspirations. So um, working with a, a tax for service program, which is sort of talking about Okay, what can we actually do in terms of manifesting the social contract in terms of okay, who's done increased revenue, who has delivered increased services, and how can we you know make the label in common across the, the board and make the links explicit? Uh, convening events around um, which we were recently involved in an event with them on digital taxation, um, which was also supported by the World Bank, and so trying to identify kind of frontier areas for work and then also best practice. And then that brings us to the donors, since we work with them. The, um, I don't want to, donors is the wrong word, the development partners, and partly that's a question of terminology and partly it's also a realistic, um, a realistic terminology given their presence in Nigeria is not, you know, a kind of massive distorted cash presence. It's of a kind of part of the landscape trying to use strategic funding and, and, um, and draw attention to things because Nigeria is a huge economy and the donors spend is small. Um, so what we've been doing at NTRN, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation, is trying to create a link between practitioners and researchers in the landscape in Nigeria and in the diaspora and in universities and the rest of the world that are working in Nigeria to sort of, you know, to redraw the link between these are the ideas, these are the challenges, and how does that work both ways? Because in a lot of public institutions in Nigeria, especially research departments have become kind of delinked from policy, you know? They have become, in many institutions, a kind of a kind of back room that's not necessarily driving or, or driven by the research agenda. So that's the work that we've been trying to do. And then you have the World Bank looking at kind of common big picture quick wins. Is it VAT? Is it, you know, IT practices that the kind of dematerialization of taxation practices? Where are the kind of 
the big things that can be got into that would make the most difference. And then we have a, a bunch of the DFID programs that we've worked with, um, you know, and, and I, I don't know if there's a way to kind of draw a commonality to their approach. I think it's that they investigate areas in which there may be untapped potential and then find out that maybe that potential isn't as untapped as people thought, you know? They tried to help ideas move around the board between peers, but actually, I think the big discovery of most of those programs has been that these kind of ideas that people come up with, oh, informal taxation, there must be something there. You quickly run up about against the problem, well, what's there that hasn't actually been engaged with in what's way, you know? So, so this is like a kind of, in terms of the policy design, there's almost an assumption of where things must be. And then a kind of quick realization that actually maybe in the Nigerian landscape, that's not where they actually lie in terms of potential. Um, but the really interesting one to me, I think, is to draw attention to the kind of third thing. And this is, the, this is my point, I think, about the thing that we don't naturally look for. And also that isn't naturally kind of shown to us by any language about statism or even any language about neoliberalism necessarily, which is the commercial drivers of policy transfer. And as academics, we are public sector people. We work in public sector institutions. And as development studies people, we look at large public sector transformations usually. Um, and I think that we undersee the commercial imperatives here. And I think that's by my big realization, both in terms of the practice and also in terms of the analysis. Because really, when you come to state governments, you start to notice that a lot of the work, and I've also done this kind of as a pure non-practitioner piece of research um, in three different states in Nigeria, is that what starts to happen as you get this kind of political economy transformation from trickle down oil money towards locally driven revenue is two things. Um, and they both happen under the same umbrella. And the umbrella is the kind of outsourcing to tax consultants. I mean, the two things that happen is one is that the tax consultants happen in a very low tech way, especially in majority rural states uh, and at the beginning of the learning curve. So this has been an overlapping thing. And I think one is trending down, the other is trending up, but they're kind of existing in the same space. So tax consultants in the sense of simple revenue collectors, you know, literally people that stand at the roadside and say, this is a truck full of logs and I have a mandate from government to collect the tax on logs and I get to keep part and this goes to government commonly used spread very quickly between states peer to peer. And the obvious attraction of that and fitting in with the kind of existing political economy is that, you know, the political networks that were previously around giving out spending contracts around maybe road contracts or whatever, you know, sometimes come into the political economy of tax consultancy in that level. It's a very localizable, um, very domesticable, very quick to spread resource. And uh, it also kind of falls into some of the same traps that you know the previous kind of patterning of political behavior so i will give a state and i won't give the name of it to avoid controversy but a state where for instance tax consultants were hired and given a lower revenue target than the civil servants were already collecting so you can see how that's you know it's simply bartering what was in a public sector into a private sector and repoliticizing a public revenue stream um and i've written about that in in, in rural locations but i think the more kind of interesting challenging sort of theoretically interesting part is the second part of outsourcing which is the it driven outsourcing because this is where a lot of the innovation has come this is where a lot of the kind of state rebuilding has come in terms of capacity and in terms of new angles about looking at the most efficient ways to know about to register to collect taxes on things like property so through things like cadastral surveys property registration uh, or people's use of markets and market fees. You know, so really, really technologized stuff. For instance, in my research in Benway State, which is published, you know, the use of point of sale machines when people go into a market to pay their 200 Naira market entry fee and that immediately registering on real time on a TV screen in the head of revenues office. You know, so very dematerialized, very kind of panopticist, very kind of direct technology leapfrogging of, you know, literally physical markets to these kind of, you know, straight into the bank account um, models. Really interesting stuff. Do you want to wrap up in a minute or two to give time for questions? I'll be dead quick. Thank you. Yeah. The key thing about this is that these IT consultancies are the people who generate the knowledge. They're the people who, in whom the policy design resides. They, they design, they build, they operate. And therefore, when you get regime change, when you get governmental change, their entire contracts are severed and we start again from the beginning and this is really really interesting because they're the people that talk to each other they're the people that innovate the models they are tied into the kind of existing networks and yet where is the residue from it where is the permanent kind of capacity addition from it 
uh, which has even led kind of uh, Nigeria governors from to recommend against using tax consultants, because although they've added this huge innovative layer and this, this kind of um, assemblage of you know, information, where none of it actually belongs to the public sector, you know, because and it goes back to the kind of thing Sam was talking about, about looking into the kind of nitty gritty details of IT outsourcing contracts, you know, the same as you do to oil reserve contracts, is if you're not an IT outsourcing expert, you don't know what you've actually bought permanently and what you're hiring. So a lot of this capacity actually lives in commercial companies. So three conclusions from this, I think, to take it back to the theoretical level. One, you know, we have to keep thinking about political parties and political networks as political commercial entities, just as in this country where there are certain kind of complexes of, of, of actors that go around that that aren't necessarily, you can't necessarily draw the line between the politics, the operation, the state, the commercial sector. Secondly, I think the interesting thing is about the kind of the dominant action in this space being about peer to peer action between states and commercial actors. It's not driven by, you know, international consultancies. It's not driven to an extent by kind of isomorphic mimicry about things like making revenue authorities independent because it's common global practice or reporting. It's actually very indigenous, very peer to peer, very not from central government, very not from outside. And that's a really, really interesting thing, which adds to other research I've done about bits of the state going upstream in other bits of the state. I find this stuff about fragmented sovereignties and fluid sovereignties and mobility really fascinating. Um, and I think the third is thinking about the politics of policy transfer in an environment where we may be used to be thinking about policy information as a public good and as something that you put out there. But other people are looking at it as innovation, as, as market advantage, as a product and how to work with people who see it in that way. And I think that's especially, you know, maybe if we came, you know, if most of us came from IT software backgrounds or business schools, we might already be in a frame of mind to think about that. But one person's public good being another person's innovative product gives us different challenges. I don't want to overdraw that challenge because we've had some great interactions with some of the commercial actors who have done work in papers, participated in forums and whatever, but there's always going to be a limit to how much people are going to want to tell you about their commercial business model and, and how much of the information or the data they want to publicize back out of that. So it draws, I think, a really interesting frontier about one, what that means in terms of the political economy of this space, and two, for me as a practitioner, how one productively works with these very different ideas about, you know, how things should travel and who they should belong to. I'll close it there. Great. Thanks, Ollie. There's always a huge amount to learn from Nigeria and also from taxation, so great to have them both uh, together. Um, the floor's open for about the next five or six minutes before we close. Uh, so I have a question, but I'll let others jump in first, uh, if anyone wants to query anything or make a comment. I can't see any hands as yet. So let me throw mine in and maybe people come up with theirs as well. Thanks, Ollie. I really enjoyed that. So, I mean, you said it's not really a, a, a global um, imposition of this idea around tax, but the idea of, ta and, and it has been a much stronger push from donors since 2015, since the Addis Conference on Financing, the idea that governments should be driving up their domestic revenue mobilisation and a whole degree of technical support thrown behind that, and not just typical donor support, but you know, HMRC doing lots of peer-to-peer -peer learning in various revenue authorities throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, Mick Moore and colleagues with this new epistemic community. There is something going on there at a global level to national level. But I'm interested in, if, if that's not the main driver, there's still an idea around revenue generation that needs to take hold for some of this to work, surely. Is it, is it all about the technical peer-to-peer -peer exchanges of, of how to do this? Or is there something bigger that needed to be broken through? Given that, okay, taxation in Nigeria is, is initially a colonial imposition, which is strongly resisted, it's part of the anti-colonial, movement you have peter ek nigerian anthropologist saying that you know you, taxation is caught up in this distinction between national and ethnic citizenship is this something that has to be overcome before any of this can be really rolled out through changed political discourses uh, or is it something that can be sort of fly under the radar radar via the sort of more technocratic peer-to-peer -peer exchanges that you're pushing at here into around commercial imperatives so i'm just interested in that sort of that shift straight towards the technical and the policy models and nothing really on the broad discourse thing needing to shift. Is, is, is that the case or is there, is there, is there action at both levels? 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's interesting. There is back action at both levels. And I think this goes back to kind of the point I made at the beginning about it being a very multi-speed country, you know, very diverse in terms of, I mean, and I made a point about models of political legitimacy, didn't I? That speaks directly to your point. So for instance, like you mentioned, Peter Eke and the idea of, and then, then the Abba Women's War and resistance to colonial taxation, there is in some places a very fertile idea that, you know, you should resist this extraction by a dominating force, right? Or you should at least demand you know, and confront it and, and make demands against it. Equally, you know, in the Emirate states of northern Nigeria, there's very sophisticated pre-colonial systems of taxation. And so what there is is a model about what taxation should be and kind of what's fair, you know. Or you've got Lagos, which is, you know, was uh, under colonial for a lot longer and was always a kind of Atlantic facing, you know, commercial space in which, you know, organized corporates and people's idea of, you know, rights under common law and you know, are already, you know, very much a kind of popular organizing principle rather than something government is bringing. And in which Lagos state government did loads, which I've written about elsewhere in terms of public communication around it. And one of the, and, and the interesting thing I think about that public communication is that the ad agencies and the PR agencies brought in, modeled it on political campaigns, you know, some marches in the street and that kind of thing around tax. So it's quite interesting for me that, 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 that the policy mobilization is based on the political mobilization, you know, but again, very homegrown you know this wasn't let's go to new york and find out what they do there this was how do we get stuff to work in other walks of public life in nigeria and apply it to tax and i think that's you know so you know absolutely the epistemic community around, around tax is very vibrant and i'm part of it and we work you know and and okay there are states in nigeria that we have connected to you know malawi to sierra Leone. and i said why don't you guys have a peer to be a conversation about what property tax things you've been doing and what you've all learned on the journey together. And that's, we see that as part of our job to kind of help engineer that community. But it's still, you know, one of a bunch of, of issues <clears throat> vying for political agenda. Why does it become the front burner issue? It's very much about simply sustaining, you know, the very direct challenges to how to do anything, you know? If you want the state to do anything beyond pay salaries, we are now at a point where, you know, everybody can see that relying on federal spending is a busted flush. And so it's really, really the innovation in this is coming, I think from Nigerian politicians slash technocrats slash commercial actors who have, so, you know, some of the most innovative people, I mean, to give you an example without naming names, one of the most innovative tax bosses in Nigeria who works in the public sector was previously somebody who worked in a major bank and you know, DSTV, the South African satellite network, he was the guy as their account manager who worked out for them how to do the bundling, you know, for sports fans, for, you know, for soap fans, whatever, you know, he was, that was his background. So it's coming from very, very diverse places in the landscape and calling on very different skill sets to what we might expect to be the kind of international tax technocrat kind of through line. Fascinating. I'm a big fan of DSTV, I have to say. I watch more, I'm able to watch more sport for you when I'm, when I'm traveling in Sub-Saharan Africa than I am here, but, uh, Leaving that to the side, do we have any more queries uh, for, or questions from the floor? We have time for probably one more uh, before we need to close. Okay. Good stuff. Right then. So thank you very much, Ollie, for that. And um, so some of it's out already. Um, and there's a, there's a working paper around this particular one. Um, There's a working paper on the first part of it, which is the revenue analysis. What, if Annie and I need to work on more, is to see what's published about the second part of it, about what's the implications for that, how policy transfer works and with the best case studies. But yeah, we will continue working on that. Good stuff. Look forward to reading it. Deb Jani, I know you're working on papers from this. There's one There's one out already, I think, and another one on the way. So maybe you can share uh, share that with us and we'll get it tweet it out and about when ready. Um, so that's that's all for today. I think it's been a really nice session. It's, it's raised some older concerns about how policy transfer in the typical North to South exchanges have historically worked out with elements of South South and now much more localized uh, forms of action around this. Uh, tomorrow's session starts at um, uh, 10 o'clock as well. Um, uh, tomorrow is, is looking and we've got uh, Laura, Lydia, Nicholas, um, Sheng Li, I think all of our presenters are actually here or have been at some point this morning, will be taken into a much more uh, focused approach to thinking about South-South transfers with a big focus on China and Brazil. 
So please do join us for those sessions tomorrow uh, and we'll try and wrap up some thoughts towards the end of it around some continuities across both sessions. So great to see you all. Um, so to see as many as possible tomorrow.